And it's a very simple song. And it's kind of like the tune of Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star. Only the words are a little different. The words are in, out, deep, slow, calm, ease, smile, release, present moment, wonderful moment. So maybe uh, those of us who know it, we can sing a little bit, and then we can all try together. So it goes. In, out, deep, slow, calm, ease, smile, release. OK, from the top, in, out. In, out, deep, slow, calm, ease, smile, release. And we'll continue. Uh, can you hear okay? Yes? I'd like to ask for support. Those who uh, can sit, who are able to sit on the cushion, and you hesitated to come up here, you can come now. <laughs> so please come up here to uh, just fill up the energy a little bit here. I'd like to see faces close up. Yeah, sit in the front row too. Yeah, fill it up. So uh, we feel in the monastery, that's how we feel support, when we feel uh, uh, the bodies are in proximity. So don't be afraid. Sit in the front. Um, we will not bite. We were sitting in the dining hall, and all the monks and nuns are on one table, and people just pass by. They're very afraid to sit next to us. <laughs> How many of you first time seeing monastics or monks and nuns? Yeah? Students here? Yeah. We were also students like you. So just, uh, I hope that makes it better that we don't, we don't come from Mars. <laughs> I grew up in Los Angeles and I went to a university and uh, it's just a different career, you know? Imagine this like a doctor's white suit, you know? So uh, we kind of look strange and we foreign and so on, but we also uh, are very close to you. And being in this campus, I feel very close to you. And I've been here for two days, and I'm revisiting all the thoughts that I had as a student and the things I did. Oh, it's such a good meditation. <laughs> mm. So welcome, everyone. Mm. Let's, uh, we'll begin with a little uh, Three Sounds of the Bell, just to do a little check-in with ourselves. So anytime you hear the bell in the monastery, it's to, just to stop and come back to ourself. And when ourself here is very simple, it's just our body and our feelings. So it's like a check-in. So if you do it regularly, you, you have more awareness of that. How's my body? So sit, sit kind of, uh, if you're on the cushion, try to sit in the front half of it, push the cushion towards the back, and your, uh, your, your knees are, if it's possible, you know, it's touching the ground. If it's okay, you know, if it's comfortable. So you make a triangulation. 
on your pelvis when you're sitting in the front half of the cushion, it kind of throws it forward and then your spine curls. So you're mimicking standing posture. So your pelvic, so once your, uh, your spine is aligned, then uh, you know, your muscle can relax. So you're not leaning forward or back, right? Do you feel that? And when you sit like that, it's very different from in class. You're like, oh, you know? So your posture expresses your state of mind. So when you sit like this, you know, more than 2,000, 3,000 years ago, people have discovered when they sit like this, it uh, induces a kind of a weird state, right? Your spine, yeah? You feel yourself more present. So it's a very, they used to fold their legs in half too, to even increase their intention. It's like, I'm not moving. I'm not gonna react. So there's a kind of training, a yogic uh, tradition. So when we sit like this and we listen to the bell, we're gonna check in. And first thing is our body. Okay, how's our body? Do we feel relaxed? You can drop your arms, right? Don't hold anything. You drop your shoulder. So that's what you'll be examining, scanning when you hear the sound of the bell. Allow your, your and you can close your eyes when the, the bell is uh, resounding. And when you close your two eyes, you have a third eye. And that's the eye of awareness. The eye of uh, inner, the inner eye. All of a sudden you're aware of your body. Right? You're aware of your body sitting. You feel that? You're aware of your body being affected by gravity. The weight. Now you can check in. You feel the weight. You check in your body. Is there any tension? Do you feel relaxed? So let's do that. Let's close our eyes so you're not distracted by your sight. And we come back to our breathing. Become aware of our breathing. Breathing in. I'm aware that this is an in-breath. Breathing out, I'm aware this is an out-breath. Just pay attention to that. Follow the breath with your awareness. Your mind's eye is following the breath as it enters, feeling your lungs, expanding your diaphragm. Breathing out, you follow the out-breath. Become aware of your whole body sitting from toes to fingertips, the back of your ears, to your hair follicles up on top of your head. How is my body doing? Just let it relax with every out-breath in, then out breath, just relax. Breathing in, aware of my body. Breathing out, relaxing. Now we become aware of our feelings, our emotions, our state of mind, our state of being. How am I feeling? Am I feeling restful, anxious, feeling calm, feeling at peace? Call it, breathing in, I recognize how I'm feeling. Breathing out, I smile to my feelings.
breathing in. I'm aware, I'm aware of planet Earth, the ground beneath me, this planet. I'm aware of the, eye, the, the air that I'm breathing, the sky, the clouds, the atmosphere, all into being with me. I've come from this earth. I'm breathing in this earth, including all the plants, all other human beings, the animals, my body and the minerals, the water. Breathing in, I'm aware of the earth within me and all around me. Breathing out, I smile to un our interconnectedness. and open our eyes. Thank you for your practice. Mm -hmm. How many of you first time doing something like that? Yeah, a few of you? Uh, look, most of you are meditators, huh? <laughs> Thank you for joining us. Mm. Today, the, it's April 18th, and we are in, what hall is this? Rollins Chapel. Rollins Chapel at the, uh, Dartmouth uh, you know, College, and we're so happy to be with you. Today's uh, uh, talk is uh, themed, the happiness is here and now. Engage mindfulness in a complex and, and, complex, in a complex and changing world. Mm. It's a lot to cover there, mm. but I just like the word happiness. <laughs> um, that's our, that's our, uh, our uh, what do you call it, our career, is to create happiness. Mm -hmm. And as monks and nuns, we, uh, uh, we, we, we wear robe and we shave our head. It's like our uniform. It's like doctors have uniform, uh, military have uniform. Uh, what else, you know, sports team, right? So think of us like a sports team, yeah? And our specialty is not bouncing a basketball. Our specialty is uh, how to take care of our self, how to take care of our suffering, how to take care of our mind, our body, and also how to generate happiness, how to generate well-being, compassion, understanding. So that is our career as monastics. Um, so those who are you know, not familiar with the, our tradition, Mm. Many of us, uh, you know, we, we actually we, we studied in university, we graduated, some with a uh, doctor's degree and like master's degree in English uh, teacher, <laughs> uh, architect, 
you know, so we, we really enjoy being here. It's only been two days. And uh, we, a lot of stuff's coming back up, <laughs> a lot of memories. Mm. And seeing uh, the, this, this stage of what the university represents, uh, which is exploring, exploring what, uh, you know, what field we want to go in, what career, what we like, right? Mm. But also, uh, you know, I, I wish there was like more courses on that. Like I had a vision to have a course on how to be a human being, simply how to be a human being or how to be happy and how to take care of our suffering. I don't know what department that would probably go on mental health, uh, but in, in humanities, it could be cool. But that's something I wish I, I had taken as a young person to really know actually how my mind works and know how my body works. Mm -hmm. So I'm not, so I don't have the, I do and say the things that I said as a young person. Mm -hmm. So slowly as I grew and graduated and worked, I, uh, I, mm, I worked in the field of architecture and being in that field, I slowly, uh, my happiness diminished. I became more selfish, more like uh, competitive. And uh, yeah, I realized at some point that I, I had a lot of suffering inside that was, uh, you know, that I, I didn't want to deal with. And one of the main one was towards my father. So even though I was succeeding and doing great things and amassing a lot of uh, money in my bank account, I still, there was something I was ignoring, which is my uh, anger towards my father. And it's through meditation that helped me uh, saw, see that, that actually ah, there's a, that, that underlying push, that dissatisfaction, that suffering that was, uh, uh, I was ignoring and it was causing me a lot of dis-ease. I was like very, uh, how do you call it, disgruntled. I had like, uh, I looked friendly and everything, but I was really, I had a chip on my shoulder, they call it. I was very, very active sometime. And through meeting my teacher, it was the first time I uh, recognized that. It was at a retreat where I finally kind of broke down and I started crying a lot because there was a lot of repressed anger. And it was so healing for me to like, like let that down. And I started to feel more at ease and actually feel a little happy. I started smiling more. <laughs> I was, you know, as a, as a young person, I was very suspicious uh, or skeptical of happy people. I grew up in Los Angeles, so we're very, you know, uh, I, nothing against L.A., but uh, it was an environment that was, uh, you know, and I had friends like that. So I'm trying to humanize us, humanize myself so you can relate. So it's from uh, that kind of suffering that helped me once I saw the origin of it, how my mind works, how I had ideas about my father that, uh, you know, that I was holding on to. And then slowly through meditation, I learned uh, to look at my father, look deeply, more deeply at my father and see his suffering, having to escape Vietnam because of the war and losing everything and the fear he had to take his whole family onto a boat out into the ocean, not knowing where to land. And you know, as a, a father, that's a lot of responsibility. So it kind of broke him. And so when he came over here, it was hard for him to adapt. So through meditation, through guided meditation, I was able to see him as a five-year-old, 18-year-old before marriage, and then like 25, 28 after he had us children, his children, and then meditating and visualizing what it was like for him during wartime in Vietnam, where everything is very unstable and not very secure. And we had a grenade thrown into our house. Can you imagine that, living in that environment? And finally, they decided to leave Vietnam and to just get on a boat and go out there and hopefully some, some country or some place would receive you. 
And so I began to see more from the eye of my father. And with, through meditation, sitting with that visualization, it softened me up. It, how you call it, untied my knot, my anger towards my father. Because now it was like I see from a different angle. And this is the power of meditation. It allows us to mm, see and look deeply, more deeply into things. And for me, from that on, point on, I, uh, yeah, I became happier and I started to see the root of uh, a lot of things I did. And so I started to make better choices. So that's the power of meditation. And that's, uh, mm, I became happier, not because I was achieving things or uh, becoming successful, but because I didn't have these knots. So that's spiritual happiness. Spiritual happiness is not like when you receive a praise, you receive a gift, or you win an award, or you get, uh, it's very externally based. Spiritual happiness comes from insight. When you, you kind of go, ah, oh, I don't have to be angry at my father all the time. <laughs> or like, I don't have to be angry at him when I hear his voice. I was like, wow, that's my choice. And I began to understand him more and feel more compassion, more, under, uh, more uh, yeah, uh, acceptance of where he's at. So for me, that was crucial in my, uh, my path. And so slowly moved on from that and became more interested in actually how my mind works and started seeing how society works. And then that was like, you know, there was no turning back. I was like, no. <laughs> you know, it's like the mouse that jumps out of the, uh, what is it, the, uh, that wheel that he jumps on? Is the mouse chasing something while he's running? No, right? Oh, isn't there like a carrot or something in front of it? No. <laughs> but uh, I felt like that. I was like, wow, I don't have to keep, I was so worried about my bank account, you know, and, and you know, many other things, about my job security and so on, these kind of wheels. Anyway, that's my personal story. You have your career and you need to take care of it. Don't quit school. <laughs> uh, I'll just share with you uh, how I entered this uh, meditation mm, practice. And uh, slowly I saw this, uh, this way of being in the world and how our world is uh, constructed, how it's framed, and why there's so much suffering and uh, discrimination, violence, uh, hate, and so on because people couldn't take care of their suffering, whether from their upbringing, from their culture, so they actually have to release that tightness. And for me, that's when uh, I realized that, mm, mm, you know, architecture to deal with space and creating buildings and stuff is one way to improve society. But then I decided to switch career, and not like thinking wise, but you know, just out of uh, a kind of um, a gut feeling when you're on a spiritual path. So that was my, my personal uh, uh, road to where I'm at as a monastic. And many of us have very similar stories like this, monks and nuns. It's through our own recognition, our insight of our suffering and our ability to actually untie those knots to understand where that suffering comes from, that we awaken, we come to realize there's another way to do this. So the freedom in Buddhism is not freedom to do anything you want, but the freedom here is to choose and to know the consequence of your choice. And so this is the freedom that many of us, why we choose to change career and to dedicate ourselves to helping other people see the same thing. That we all each have a little knot inside. And all that happiness that's external cannot feel that, cannot heal that. So it's through understanding to accepting uh, that whatever we're carrying and understanding it more in it opens up and we have more space within our heart and our mind. Our teacher, mm, mm, 
name is uh, Thich Nhat Hanh, and he also was going through a lot in, during the war. And he came to the West to find, uh, to, to, um, for peace, to bring peace to our country. This is in the early 60s. Because you see that uh, he saw that the root of the war that was happening in Vietnam was in, in America, where we're sending troops and, um, uh, and artillery over. And people asked him, why do you, you come to America? He said, this is the root of it, because there's a wrong perception about what Vietnam is heading towards. It was like their fear of communism. So that idea, that fear, will create a whole group of people to be violent towards another and kill. And so you see the, the origin of war is not, uh, you know, or guns or, or, and so on, or violence and mass shooting, although that is a, a means, but it's from our wrong perception, our ideas, and our inability to deal with our own suffering. And then we take it out on others. We get disillusion, we have, uh, we, we, we create a group and we name it, and then we make them become, uh, we demonize them. A group of people, uh, uh, so Thai came to America. And when our teacher came to America to, to um, call for peace, uh, he met many people and he stayed, um, he gave lectures and tours. And then he was actually in exile from coming back because he was calling for peace. So they accused him of being part of the Northern or being part of American uh, uh, politics. So he was uh, exiled from coming back to Vietnam. So he got stuck in the West. So he got, uh, took refuge in France. And being in the West, he started to see the root of war even further. So it's just not Vietnam War, or the war in Vietnam, but he starts to see the war in our way of structuring our, our, our livelihood, uh, our society. A lot of dis-ease, a lot of stress, a lot of inability to handle our suffering. And so Thay began, our teacher began to give retreats to teach mindfulness. And here, the mindfulness is not to retreat, to a monastery, to the mountain, but it's a, a kind of new uh, engaged mindfulness, or actually is well known for bringing the term uh, engaged Buddhism to the meditative world. And here it means uh, uh, not just sitting on the cushion and meditating, but through our daily life, we can engage and be using that same insight to examine, to look at what we are doing. This is what engaged mindfulness is. So mindfulness is a, a kind of energy. The one I share with you, that inner eye, the way of uh, looking, right? You're listening to me and you're aware, right? You're present. And anytime you have a thought that goes away and you're aware of it, it is your mindfulness. Your mind is aware of what is happening. You see that? Now you're aware of your sitting. So you're constantly aware of something. That's our attention. That is universally happening. And what meditation is, is just slowing that process down so you can see. Can you see the commentator in your head right now? Oh, I like what he's saying. Oh, well, I don't know. What, is he, what does he mean by that? There's always a... Com if you can see that commentator is a great... Uh, 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 step already. So, so that awareness is from my, uh, an energy called mindfulness. Mindfulness just means that your mind is fully present. Okay? You, you, you can feel that. Okay? When you start thinking, just try to get your mind out of here. Go think about uh, like your oven at home. Or like what you're going to do next. Right? Your mind goes there, right? They say you're not here. So when you're fully here, what does that mean? You're fully alive. Right? So when you're eating, so engaged mindfulness can be applied to many things. So it's meditation 
throughout the day in any aspect of our lives. The one I first learned uh, that I brought home was brushing your teeth with mindfulness. Because I used to brush my teeth like this, like I was like doing concrete uh, breaking. <sighs> and the dentist always say, why is your gum so like, uh, you know, uh, receded, you know? <laughs> you should see how I brush my teeth. And through meditation, not through the dentist, the dentist would tell me, he's like, chill out, I'm brushing your teeth, you know? <laughs> Why do you, you don't have to brush it so hard, but I never listened to him. But through meditation, my teacher says, like, you know, take your toothbrush and be grateful that you have, do not have a toothache. And I love that. When I heard first that, it's like, you know, you're always like painful when you have a, a toothache, right? but are you grateful that you don't have a toothache right now? Just take a moment. Who, who has a toothache right now? Maybe some, right? So this is a happy moment. How many of you have had a toothache before? Especially the ones in the back. <laughs> yes. Right? And you, when you have a toothache, you're just like, oh, come on. <laughs> you, like to, you know, it's so painful, and you have to go to the dentist to relieve it. But what, what allows us uh, to actually, you know, see that this moment, just aware that right now I don't have a toothache, all of a sudden you turn nothing a neutral moment to a grateful moment. And so I started brushing my teeth and I switched hand. I, I'm a right hand person and then I switch hand. And so I retrain myself to be kind to my teeth. And that was my first kind of uh, meditation or mindfulness. Mindful of tooth brushing and nourishing my spirit here, spirit is not some woozy, you know, thing. But spirit here is my mind being aware, being grateful. So, my, so I'm not just brushing my teeth. I'm feeling grateful towards my teeth. I know this sounds very, what is it, banal? Is that right? It's kind of like, you know, it's like, why is he talking about that? What does that have to do with anything? But it had to do with everything. Because I started brushing my teeth, and then I remember appreciating the toilet paper, <laughs> and then the soap in my shower, you know, when it was like only a few, uh, the bar was only uh, so much left, you know, and it was kind of like you have to like mold it. And then when I got a new, a new, yeah, it, it's, my meditation didn't start in the meditation hall, it started in the bathroom. <laughs> it went from toothbrush to toilet, to a bunch of ants crawling, I remember, and then to appreciating the soap, and then moving on to the door practice. So this is engage mindfulness. Engage here is not just engaging social issues and so on. Engaging here is bringing meditation to all the little activities, because those little activities nourish your mindfulness, this energy of being aware and being grateful. Like, wow, thank you, Mother, for the meal. Oh, thank you, neighbor, for uh, blowing the leaves from our... And then you go say that to that person. So you begin to live your life very differently. It starts from being grateful for the little things, and then it moves on, and it starts to expand. And this is very, very important now. I think in our society now, there's, we're a little bit overloaded with uh, uh, mm, news about bad things happening. And I think as human beings, we have to be very careful. I don't think we were, uh, uh, what do you call it, we evolved to receive so much information daily about everything that is happening in the world. And in the news, they focus mostly on negative things as happening. So this is a very root to public mental health as well as personal mental health. So through mindfulness, 
how we uh, learn to take care of ourselves, how we eat. I remember eating. That's something, uh, uh, you know, normally in college, in uh, my workplace too, I used to eat before I became vegan, vegan I, and vegetarian. I used to eat these uh, uh, Del Taco burrito. They're like this. I don't know if they have them now. But I can eat it in two bites. <laughs> and I would buy four or five of them. And I would eat it like uh, just to fill my stomach up so I can continue to do my drafting before they had a computer, uh, uh, you know. <laughs> but, you know, I would eat it to just fill uh, the thing, uh, my stomach up. And so that habit of, uh, uh, how do you call it, just shoving things in my mouth, it was, it, it was trained from architectural school. And so there's these habits that we have. And through a retreat, I first time that I actually, you know, the teacher taught me to eat the broccoli and call it broccoli, put it in your mouth and chew it 30 times. So I did a social experiment to see, let's see what happened. And I began to really savor food. And I felt, I remember like all of us do, we, we get full really quick because we're chewing our food. And then I started reducing how much I take and appreciating. And I share this often uh, because it was a moment for me eating salad. I shared it. I love sharing it to young people. But uh, for eating salad without the dressing, you know, they had uh, ran out of food and there's only rice left and then salad. And they even ran out of soy sauce. So I ended up eating salad. I remember um, having the thought, I was like, this is the first time I've eaten salad on its own in my entire life. And I was chewing it and just feeling, I, I'm savoring, um, my mouth is watering now, <laughs> bringing that memory up from salad. And tasting the tomato without anything on it. And that's, that's unbelievable. I was like maybe 26 years old. And it's the first time I eat something where I'm savoring it for its own flavor. And I remember thinking, it's like, God, oh, yeah, isn't it be nice? And I, you know, that helped me a lot to begin to look at myself. So those little moments like that when you, those are little aha moments. When you're fully present with the food, when you're fully present with someone you're talking to and you're listening with engage awareness, engage, then you can understand them and hear them more than what they're saying. You really, I get it. So this engaged mindfulness can really help us not with our own lives, but in our, in our relations as well. And as we, we expand further, we begin to look at how our society, our culture is structured, what we do, how we produce things, how we consume things through the media, through the movies, through the games, through the internet. Then you use this engaged mindfulness to look deeply at how things affect one another. You see the power of meditation? So mindfulness can be generated. When you come to a monastery to a retreat, we train you to be mindful of your steps, of your food, of your breath, of your body, of your feelings. And so through this, you have your, your, your battery, your capacity to be more aware and not uh, be dispersed, become stronger and stronger. This is the, the power of this tradition. It's called meditation tradition. It's not exclusively Buddhist. Many, many traditions have it. They call it different things, prayer and so on. But it's a way of centering ourselves so we know what is happening within us, our emotion, and what is happening to our interaction. Maybe we can listen to one sound of the bell and come back to our breath and do a little check-in.
before starting here, uh, my brother uh, taught us a song, I Have Arrived, I Am Home. That song uh, is uh, also was a, a first time that it kind of made me look deeply at things, that how we're, I was constantly running our culture, our, my education, always uh, trained me to uh, look towards the future uh, and to see what I'm going to get. So it uh, kind of diminished my uh, ability to be truly present in the moment. So I was always thinking of the next thing. You know, if you, you travel from, you know, uh, you want to go get coffee, you go get coffee and you're like, oh, I got to go over there. Oh, I got to, you know, you're constantly jumping from one thing to the next. So I think that I see that it's become more intense nowadays. Is that, is that true? I don't know. It's maybe my wrong perception. But I think this gadget, uh, it really helped uh, us move towards uh, even more intense rushing energy, uh, a constant, uh, uh, it's a push. And so this, um, these two words arrive and at home really helped me at the beginning to feel um, arriving here is arriving in the present moment. To always check anywhere you're, you're at. So it's not a destination that we have to, or someone, somewhere we have to go, someone we have to meet. But here is arrival in the present, the here and now. And so always check in with that. It's like, where is my mind right now? So this in all of your activities, this is, uh, uh, this is the greatest, uh, how you call it, uh, uh, this is the most precious thing that we can have as human beings. Because the evolution has evolved us as animal species to this point where we are, we're, we're, I wouldn't say the top of the, the food chain or whatever, but we are affecting as if we are. But like where we are now, we have this ability, you know, to actually know that we're alive, to be grateful, to, to you know, all these emotions that are like attributed to the homo sapien species, right? This is a powerful thing that we have. And it, this is the, you know, the war in Vietnam, the war in Ukraine, but fundamental to all those wars is the war for our attention, our, our mind, our presence. Everything wants to pull you away from that. This is uh, what is happening in, in the next, cent oh, 21st, are we in the 21st century? Yeah? This is going to be, and, and I think some of you know already that, the, the, that that's all they want is your, uh, your clicks, your likes, your, 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 your wanting to grab. All these big companies, they just want your attention to be there. Isn't that amazing? This is the last uh, uh, mineral, like diamond, gold, and whatever. It is your mind. And if you don't know how it works, you will be a slave. Sorry to... And so this is a, a choice um, that we're going to have to uh, uh, get to a point where we're... That will be the... Yeah, go around, look like that with your eyes and say, see where is everybody's attention. I love doing, at the airport, I love to do that. I sit there and I watch. I want to find one person who is fully present. I play a game at the airport. So I sit there and I watch and I see if I can find one person who is not somewhere else. It's a great, you, I find some and you can see they're like usually around children. <laughs> Children, like, if you're somewhere else, you're very boring. So this is, for me, the, the root of a lot of, uh, if you're not fully present, then you break down, you're achieving and doing things that are meaningless. You're choosing a career for other people, for your parents, and, and then you become this ease, right? And that suffering there, 
makes you do other things. So a man, you support other things, supporting violence and so on. So for me, the root of war and why we, a root of violence, the root of uh, a lot of things that you see that's happening is that our inability as human species to actually harness that awareness, that presence, so we know what is going on. And also looking deeply. Okay, that's the first part. Stopping, recognizing, being present, holding. And the second part of meditation, you get to look at it. You look deeply, you examine it. It's very, very in line with uh, the, the, some of the science uh, methodology. And then you begin to see the root of why things happen. We were just at a biology uh, uh, a class. Mm. And it's so interesting to see where we come from, the minerals, the atoms, and how it affects our ATPs and so on. And we need a class like that to see where your thought come from. I want to assist D say, so when you have a thought, where does it come from? The universe. What part? <laughs> you know, you have to know. You have to... And this is the power of meditation. You know, when you see your two friends arguing, you're like, ah, I know why they're arguing. I'm not getting into this. And they ask you, say, come on, wh what side are you on? I'm like, no, both of you are right. You see the government, they can't accept that they can both have a way to be on this planet. So this is for me in terms of, or any group of people, nations, you look at any conflict and you have to go down, down to the human, the basic human, the atom, the, what do you, what do you see? You go, go down to the more root of it. It comes down to how they were raised, their upbringing, their culture, and why they hold the notions and the views they hold. So you, when you begin to see that, you can't blame them. They are violent, they're discriminatory because they grew up from that environment, that culture, that little petri dish, what do you get? petri dish? The, the, the petri dish, yeah. <laughs> it's a kind of culture. <laughs> Put it in there and see what happens. And you can produce a certain kind of person. So when you begin to see that, you don't, your heart is not filled with, you know, with meanness, with hatred. You begin to, and then you engage and you try to have dialogue without being emotional and reactionary. And then you become a person who can affect change. This is the route if most of you want to improve the environment, improve uh, racial issues or any cause that you feel passionate about. Engage mindfulness will help you take care of yourself your feelings, your body, uh, your thoughts, your notions, where they come from. And then when you engage in your cause, you can know how it's affecting other people, whether it's going the right way. You see that? So in that way, you learn how to take care of it and make that cause become more uh, sustainable. So you can do that with your own body. So you're sustainable, you're balanced, you're, mm, you can take care of your suffering and can generate happiness. And then as a group, you can do the same. So this is, a, what do you call it, uh, scalable. Yeah, that's a word. I'm using words I haven't yet uh, uh, used, uh, you know, based on being in the university. <laughs> so that's a, a little bit... Um, in terms of uh, how we can engage our complex and changing world. And I, I like the word that is changing. So it has a lot of potential because it's always changing. But the question is, is uh, you know, what, what ch direction, what change do we want it to go towards? So we are becoming more and more aware of, uh, more tolerant of different kinds of people different kinds of choice, different looks, different colors of skin. The young people are more tolerant than when I was growing up in the 80s, the Reagan era, much more, uh, much more tolerant than I, I, you know, uh, in, when I interact with young people and more awareness of our planetary uh, situation. 
I can't believe they convinced a whole group of people to carry around a bottle of water. That's like, you know, they convinced us to smoke, and now a lot of people don't smoke anymore. I see these little booths for smokers. Amazing what we can do. You know these water bottles everybody's carrying? There was one person that came to the monastery. His bottle was this big. And it's like a camel, right? But we, we can convince people that, to carry that thing around. He brought it into the meditation hall. And I was like, wow. It's amazing what you can get people to do. <laughs> so just that means uh, there's a lot of potential to actually change our lifestyle, the choices whether it's dairy, meat, uh, uh, the electrical, where the source of energy comes from. So it gives me a lot of hope. That's what I'm sharing, that this, this changing dynamic nature. I wanted to, I know we have about mm, 10 more minutes. I hope that was helpful. Uh, I was sharing mostly from inspiration, but I wanted to see if there was any uh, uh, one or two question out there about meditation or about uh, what I had shared. Um, yes? So we about, um, uh, wait, maybe a mic so those in the back can hear. Um, so I think that's something that you talked about that I relate to a lot is like my phone and my technology kind of makes me feel like I always need to look forward. And I feel like for me that started a lot with COVID because learning went online and I became a lot more dependent on my technology. So do you have any like advice or insight into that, how maybe we can like refocus our learning instead of being dragged away and distracted by our technology as we learn? Yeah, it's very interesting. In the class, I noticed everybody has laptops now. Yeah, and uh, my niece, uh, I took, uh, I was at home visiting, and I, I went to her online class during COVID, and she would be one window with the class, and she had other windows on for the different class and doing that at the same time. But it was amazing. She actually could hear the lecture as well. So you know, her brain is kind of like switching. She can multitask. <laughs> I saw it, but it's probably not good because it, uh, it affected, she was doing an art class as well. So it probably affects her. Um, so I know it's evolving, definitely. Um, there's a quick judgment that, uh, you know, the electronics and stuff is like uh, making us, uh, uh, how do you call it? Uh, um, I see uh, very easily distracted. Like, we can only handle so much information, you know, like pockets, right? I see that's affecting. The way I'm looking at it is more like a, a kind of amazement, like we are evolving. And, and you can see in terms of relation to our happiness, you know, that's a, so in, you know, so we're not like anti-technology. But even in the monastery, we are also uh, being affected by technology, Wi-Fi, wi internet access. So we have to create boundaries for ourselves. Like at 10 o'clock, you know, it's like, you know, uh, no Wi-Fi. And then there's like, you know, my brother, he, he puts all his electronics in a different room. So we are also uh, aware that technology is uh, affecting our, our, our society and so on. So with this uh, energy of mindfulness and as a collective, we know what we want and we know what affects us negatively. And we sit and we discuss this and to create boundaries for ourselves individually and then collectively. So in a way, you, you have to kind of know and set boundaries for yourself. So it's not a right or wrong. And you can't say, no, I'm just going to write by pencil, right? So you have to know where your weakness is. You know, some young men, like at nighttime, they practice to, you know, shut off their internet because they feel all their negative habit energies come up. So these are things is uh, very self-empowering uh, 
that you need to make that choice, right? And through mindfulness, you're aware how it's affecting you, negatively or positively. And then you have to set up training. And if it's hard for you, I would suggest come to the monastery for three months. Because <laughs> that's how you get a new habit. Is uh, some, uh, some gentlemen come and they give me their phone and I hold it for uh, you know, a week for them. And they feel, you know, that they, they, they begin to see their, their kind of symptoms, you know. <laughs> yeah, and they, they begin to start to see, and then they see a way forward for them. You see that? So our, our thing is not right or wrong, or that this is the way, but we give the tools for you to see it for yourself, and you have to create your boundary. Yeah, but if it's sometimes it requires a lot of self, uh, uh, you know, if you, you, you need help, then you find friends or communities or a monastery to uh, kind of, mm, how do you call it, uh, you know, you know, catalyst for the change. Maybe one more quick question. Yeah. Thank you for a real question. They're very practical. Anyone else? What about goals? What about goals? What about aspirations? How do they fit in? Wonderful. Yes. Uh, in that goal, goals here is um, we, all, we have goal too. Our goal is to help people kind of see stuff for themselves, right? I mean, goals could be is a way of looking into the future. Mm. But the way we look at goal is uh, uh, you know, the future is what we build. So how I live myself in the present moment makes my future. So it's uh, usually before I used to think as a goal is something that I have in my mind that's in the future and that I will go towards. Like I was going to be an architect. Right? And those things are always uh, based on a notion that you have about yourself. And a lot of suffering I see with people is that when they have that notion about themselves in the future and what they're going to do and what they should achieve, it actually really causes a lot of suffering for them in the present moment. They will actually sacrifice the present moment because of their notion of what happiness is. So that's very, very, once you, once I began to see how that works, that our notion of happiness, our notion of success, our notion of what is our purpose, or what is meaningful to do with this life that is 80, 90 years old. We have notions. And if we don't begin to examine where those notions come from about what we want to do, our goal, then, you know, when you hit 70, I've met many people, you know, they're like, God, you know, what did I do? Why did I do it? And so on. They come to the monastery and they have that, and then I have to tell them it's not too late. You still have 20 more years or 10 more years or five more years. So it's still good to, to change your goal. <laughs> so for me, the goal is very linked to our notion, our ideas about ourselves or our purpose, or what brings us meaning. For me, the way I look about the future now is like, what I do now creates my future. What I do now also affects how I look at my past. So when you have insight, it's like, wow. This is how I want to affect the world. This is the better way to affect the world. Like, my insight was realizing you know, no matter how much a beautiful building I build for this couple, I, I, I had this client. It was like a multi-million dollar house, and I was working on the weekend for their window, overlooking a great view of LA. And I know by the time I'm finished with that project, they're gonna be divorced. <laughs> because, <laughs> and I was like, why am I working on the week? I, I, sorry, that was very personal, you know? Is it, it's a real a moment like working on a Saturday evening designing something 
that would not be enjoyed. And I saw the root that actually comes, well, how we enjoy something, how we appreciate life is really based on our mind and how we perceive the world. You understand that? So I began to see, that's when I wrote my teacher, it's like now I understand that it's not just about the space of architecture, but it's of a space inside people. If people don't have space inside, there's no way they can enjoy anything. So for me, my, that insight right there switched my goal. I began to really see, like, my, I want to understand how this works between my two ears. Because I started becoming a better, uh, a, a happier person, a better person, I guess, and not running after these things. I zero my bank account. I can't believe I ended up, uh, I had a retirement. Uh, my friend, uh, his father an investor, and I was already thinking about my retirement plan, and I'm not even 30 years old. So there's these goals that you want. You're, you're, you know, you're already 30, and you're thinking about a retirement plan. That's just, anyway. So when I empty my bank account, I uh, uh, cut my credit cards. It's, it was amazing. You know, I remember cutting my credit card. Zeroing my bank account, cutting. My, don't do this, by the way. <laughs> this is very biased, okay? But the the goal changed. I began to see that there is no security out there. That's scary, you know. To 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 see this is kind of a little bit unconventional. So this is not for everyone. Um, but for me personally, that's I share with you how I switched my goal to see what our purpose is in life is. And for me, now, from how I view the future is uh, how I look at my day, how I look at how, what I'm doing with my brothers and sisters. So it's very more closer to the present moment and not based on an idea about uh, the, the future. I don't know if that makes sense. So my relationship to the future is very, uh, uh, you know, very... Uh, closer to my uh, uh, immediate life. Like we're building a, a, a monk's resident, and I use, we have to raise funds. That's about the future, it's about goal. It has a goal, we have a budget to raise, yeah? Uh, but we use that opportunity to create all these crazy events to raise fun, but it's so much fun. <laughs> and we really don't care how much money they're gonna, you know, uh, uh, what is it, donate? We just had a, a rave at the monastery, you know, <laughs> a music festival, you know. It was so much fun, you know. Did I say rave? <laughs> music festival. Do you see that? That's very, we nourish our present moment, our community now, no matter how much oriented uh, the future, you know, we have. We do have a goal, but it's not the end. I don't know if that relates. But we do have goals, uh, but it doesn't make us uh, sacrifice our present, okay? Thank you, everyone. If we may, we can, yeah? So uh, I just wanted to thank you and to let any students know that we're going to be eating at Tucker, if you'd like to come over to the Tucker Center in South Fairbanks for a meal with the monks. And then that will break the ice so that tomorrow when you see them in FOCO, you might sit down with them. Where? FOCO? No, no, no. So, and then also tomorrow morning at 8 a.m. again, this week, all, every morning we're having morning meditation at 8. And then tomorrow afternoon this time we'll have meditation too. So if you're not a morning person, you can meditate with the monks uh, tomorrow at 4.30 here. And that also... We have two retreats, so there's posters in the back with a scan me. If you want to learn more about the public events, just scan that with your iPhone. It'll take you to our website so you can learn about other ways that you can uh, interact with our guests this week. Thank you. Thank you for allowing us to be here and being open to uh, be with us. We'll end here with uh, some gratitude. Uh, building from the non-toothache. Expand that to people in your lives, things happening in your own life. 
that maybe you did not appreciate and bring them into your heart. Someone might be suffering, might be in pain. So we can close our eyes and we can visualize them. We can visualize ourselves as well. And sending that gratitude could be towards ourself, towards the one we love. Someone might be challenging us, might be difficult for us. They also need this energy. Please take a moment to massage our legs. Thank you, legs, for uh, sitting, <laughs> allowing us to sit so long. How many of you have seen us sitting, eating in, in the lunch, at lunch? Any of you? No? Uh, we eat over at the uh, commons. So if you want to join us for lunch, every day we eat there. Kind of social experiment to sit with the monks and nuns and see how you react. Or <laughs> so in a moment, we'll stand up and we can uh, uh, make a, our palms like this, like a flower. And we express gratitude to our, towards each other for being here. And we bow down like that. It's like uh, offering a flower spiritual flower, a flower for you, a beautiful person you are.
And then we turn one bow to all our teachers. <laughs>